Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know some people are still joining. Um, my name is Kendra Strauss. I'm the director of the Labor Studies Program here at Simon Fraser University. Um, I'm gonna do a very brief introduction uh, before we get started with our wonderful speakers. So welcome to mega sporting events, the pol policies, politics and practices of oppression. And I just want to start uh, with a brief land acknowledgement. So I'm actually joining today from the unceded and stolen territory of the Wissanic peoples. But I want to also respectfully acknowledge that the three campuses of Simon Fraser University reside on the unceded and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, Salatooth, Katsi, Quiquitlam, Kwaikwet, Kwantlen, Semiamu and Sawasan peoples. So this webinar is the third webinar in our series, um, A Just Recovery. It's a webinar series hosted by the Labor Studies Program and the SFU Morgan Center for Labor Research at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. So today's topic, uh, as I mentioned, is mega sporting events, the policies, politics and practices of oppression. And today our speakers are going to be commenting on what can be done to address labor exploitation in mega sporting events and what are models for building collective power and programs to support workers of all kinds. I just wanted to let you know um, that the, our, our final webinar uh, in this series um, is going to take place on Friday, June 25th, so in about a month's time, and it's going to focus on the question of a basic income for British Columbia. Um, British Columbia recently released a report of a basic income panel, and we're going to have speakers focusing on the findings of that report and debating uh, basic income policy policies for BC. So please do join us if you're interested. Um, and if you want to be kept up to date with future webinars, you can follow us uh, on Eventbrite so that you automatically get updates when a new webinar is added. So I just want to let you know a little bit about how uh, things are, are organized for our webinar today. So just to let you know that that attendees are automatically muted with your cameras turned off. So that's something that we as the organizers centrally control. And the chat is also disabled. So we will primarily use the chat to communicate with you if there are any issues that we need to make you aware of. However, we are very much looking forward to a discussion uh, and Q&A after our speakers' comments. And you can submit a, a question for our speakers at any time through the Q&A function. So as you're listening uh, to people speak, if there's anything that interests you or a question that you want to ask, please don't feel like you need to wait to the end to put that question in the Q&A. We'll be gathering those questions and then our moderator will be posing those questions to our speakers after their comments. So I just want to apologize in advance if we don't get to everyone's question. Um, it's sometimes not possible to, to be able to get through them all, but please do feel free to, to submit your questions as you think of them. The webinar will be recorded and in fact a, a YouTube video of this webinar will be made available on the Labor Studies YouTube channel. So please feel free, um, you'll be made aware uh, of the link for that and please feel free to circulate it in future to anyone you think might be interested who wasn't able to attend today. Um, and we do try and collect feedback from people on the webinars, uh, so, so please look out for that if you have any comments for us afterwards. So I'm, I'm going to try and move on quite quickly to make sure that we have most of, of the time for our, our speakers and our moderator. And I, I'd just like to conclude my comments by introducing our moderator today. Um, Laya Behabani is a PhD student at SFU's School of Communications, and her research focuses on human trafficking, slavery, and forced labor in the Gulf states of the Middle East. Laya is also the director of the Student Experience Initiative and 
and we're very lucky to have her as a lecturer in the labor studies program as well. And Laya lives and works as an uninvited guest on the unceded Coast Salish territories of the West Coast. Um, it's my great pleasure to have Laya moderating this webinar today, and I'm now going to pass over to her. Thank you so much, Kendra, for your warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here today. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. My name is Laya, as Kendra mentioned, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the unceded and ancestral lands of the Semiamu, Katsi, and Sawasan peoples. I'm thrilled to introduce our amazing panel, who have very kindly agreed to tackle questions around what can be done to address the various forms of exploitation that the labor force behind mega sporting events such as the World Cup, the Formula One, and the Olympics encounter, as well as models for building collective power and creating responses and programs to support workers. They will speak to how we must use this moment to address systemic inequalities and how work is valued, whose work is valued, and how forms of oppression operate in the sectors that support mega sporting events. As mentioned, please do note your questions uh, to the panelists in the Q&A uh, space below, and we'll, we'll try to answer as many of those questions as possible. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first respected panelist, Vani Saraswati, who is very generously joining us from Bangalore in India, which is now past midnight there. So we're very fortunate to have Vani with us. Vani is the editor at large and director of projects at migrantrights.org and the author of Stories of Origin, The Invisible Lives of Migrants in the Gulf. In 1999, she relocated to Qatar, working with several local and regional publications and launching some of Qatar's leading periodicals. In her 17 years in Qatar, she mobilized as a grassroots community to help migrants in distress. She's a member of the Migration, uh, migration Advisory Group, previously known as the Policy Advisory Committee of the ILO ROAS, and the Policy Advisory Group of Freedom Funds Ethiopia Hotspot, and Humanity United's Advisory Group on Forced Labor and Human Trafficking. Vani currently divides her time between India, Qatar, and other GCC states. We are also very fortunate to have, along with Vani, Fabienne Goa, our second panelist here today, joining us from France, also co uh, connecting late in the evening. So thank you, Fabienne, for making time to be here. Fabienne is a research manager at Fair Square Projects. He has over a decade of human rights experience, in, experience focusing on corporate accountability, migrant workers' rights, uh, and the USA. Fabian came to Fair Square from BSR, where he provided human rights research and guidance for businesses in construction, food and beverage, and technology sectors. Previously, Fabian was special advisor on sports and labor rights at Amnesty International, with a focus on the Qatar 2022 World Cup. He also worked on Guantanamo Bay, torture in the CIA secret detention program, and US criminal justice issues, including police use of force, solitary confinement, and sentencing of juveniles. Fabian has a master's in migration and law from Queen Mary's University of London. He speaks English, French, and Mauritian Creole. He is based in Paris. Lastly, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Jules Boykoff with us, joining us uh, from Oregon in the United States. Jules is the author of four books on the Olympics games, most recently, No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Mega Sports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Beyond, and Power Games, A Political History of the Olympics, published by Verso in 2016. His work has appeared in academic journals like the International Review for the Sociology of Sports, New Political Science, and the International Journal of the History of Sports, as well as outlets like the New York Times, The Nation, and the Los Angeles Times. He teaches political science at Pacific University in the USA. With that, I invite Vanny to open up the panel. Thank you so much, Vanny, and welcome. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, and I'm really keen to speak. I do know Fabian well. Um, very keen to hear from Jules as well. And um, this is such a nice way to begin a webinar, uh, you know, with the acknowledgement uh, of land theft and with the, um, you know, of course, you all didn't use the word human rights, but historical human rights abuse, you know, acknowledging that. And it just got me thinking as that Kendra was offering that, that uh, hopefully we don't wait for this period to be a historic memory before we offer apologies to the migrants who worked in the Gulf, right? Maybe this is something we should do right now. 
and not as an apology, but as a correction of the lives that they lead um, on how things could be better for them right now. Um, and so that the future generations, their children, don't get trapped in the cycle of exploitation, which we've already seen in the last few decades. Uh, not sure how many of you are familiar with the Kafala system and with the Gulf politics. I'm gonna touch upon it very, very briefly, very broadly. So we have Kafala-like visa regimes across the world. That's employer-tied visas, where the employer brings in people, um, limited labor rights, low wages, but the difference between what we see in the rest of the world and the Gulf is in the Gulf, this is the only way to work in any of those states, the six states, Saudi, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, and UAE. There are no alternative visa regimes and there is no pathways to belonging. There is no um, labor rights in terms of mobilization, in terms of freedom of association. So if you're a migrant worker, no matter if you're there for a two-year contract or for multiple two-year two contracts that go on to 20 years and 30 years, all your productive life, you will continue to live in the margins of the society. You will continue to be denied living with your family because you'll never earn enough to justify bringing your family in as if that requires a justification. Uh, you will not, you cannot afford um, to be a complete part of the society because these are very expensive countries, but you're paid wages that are calculated based on cost of living in your home countries. This kind of exploitative nature is across the Gulf states. And for decades, we've only heard about how to reform it. So when we hear about kafala reforms, when we hear about reforming certain immigration laws or reforming certain um, labor codes, the assumption is that the basic ones are strong and it just requires a bit of tweaking. However, this is not right because the very basis on which these laws have been built, have been designed, executed, is to marginalize, is to disempower the group that is a numerical majority, but the minority when, comes, when it comes to access to power. Uh, the reason this is important to note is if you look at a country like the UAE or Qatar, uh, foreigners make up more than 85% of the population, close to 90% of the population, over 95% of the labor market. And the majority of this group are lower income workers who come from Asian countries, South Asian countries, and increasingly from a few African countries, from Eastern Africa particularly, but you're seeing more of a migration from Western Africa. So what happens is you have this environment where there's a huge dependency, where none of the Gulf states, some of the richest in the world can survive even a few hours of economic operations without the migrant population that are working there. They would literally collapse. Um, but this recognition is never mainstreamed. The discourse is always that workers come from a poor country. It's better here for them in the Gulf than where it is um, than in their own home countries. We try very hard to break this down um, with very little success. Now, coming to sporting events, in the region, the first big event was the F1 in 2004 in Bahrain. Um, it did not get as much attention around the human rights of migrant workers. The focus was more on the political scene in Bahrain. Um, and also, there wasn't too much infrastructure development around F1. The next big event was the Asian Games in 2006 in Qatar in Doha. And strangely, you did not have a mobilization around migrant workers either, even though uh, the Asian Games covers the countries from which migrants come. And uh, this again reflects what is important, whose sport is important, whose event will take center stage. So a few years later, uh, in 2010, when Qatar won the World Cup, then the discourse changed. It became big. It became an international engagement because it was football. So we also need to start questioning 
what is it that we identify it? What is it that we think is important? Because the Asian Games is a very important uh, event. It's uh, there are more countries participating in an Asian Games than you know in the final football tournament. But it did not get the kind of attention it should have got at that point, when there were fewer workers, when there were about half the number of workers as there are now, when things could have changed. But in any case, it did not happen. It started happening after the World Cup. And what we saw around the World Cup was the discourse locally, there was pride that they had won the World Cup. This was before the Gulf blockade. So there was a regional pride. Most of the other Gulf countries were very happy. They did see an opportunity for some kind of economic benefits for them as well as being neighbors to Qatar. Uh, that was until the blockade that happened. But the awareness on human rights of migrant workers, the dependency of migrant workers was limited. The criticism that came from outside was seen as uh, racist because some of it was, but there was no, uh, locally people were not taking ownership. And that is when we started realizing, those of us living there, that you cannot bring about change, you cannot bring about sustainable change unless there's a community of practitioners locally, unless there's a civil society that recognizes the exploitation, unless there are young Qataris who you know, stand up and say, we are not comfortable profiting from this level of exploitation. We still don't have it. Over 10 years after the World Cup was won, a year and a half before it's going to be held, we still don't have that consciousness locally, which I think is what we need to address in terms of, you know, I mean, the, the event's name, today's event's name is policies, politics, and practices. How do we change policies? How do we bring about a political change? How do we bring about a behavioral change? If you don't have buy-in from the people who profit from it, of course, the people who are profiting from it are also multinational corporations from abroad, uh, you know, from the global north. And uh, one of the things about the kafala is not just about individual visas, even businesses need to have local partners. So there are partnerships between uh, large corporations from the outside and local businesses. We are still not seeing a change outside of the very narrow confines of what is considered a football, uh, you know, what is considered the World Cup projects. So the World Cup projects, for instance, employ just about 30,000 workers whereas we have 1.5 million lower income workers in Qatar. Um, so very early on then, the, idea, uh, the way Qatar dealt with criticism was to say we have very strong workers welfare standards for all of the World Cup projects. So the Supreme Committee did introduce some very, very commendable, very strong regulations within for all their contractors which looked at accommodation, which looked at wages, which looked at recruitment costs, which uh, Fabian will be speaking more about. They did do all that, but it affected only a small minority. And what we also saw was if X company had five contracts, one of it was with Supreme Committee, where 20% of its employees were working, those 20% of employees did have better terms than the rest of the 80 because the rest of the 80 were not on Supreme Committee projects. So we saw this dichotomy of, you know, which group of workers have better rights. So you saw so many fragmentation, even in rights discourse, and this was problematic. And this continues to be problematic because um, at this point, when we are bringing up how the legislations impact the majority, because the Supreme Committee uh, projects and the regulations with within the Supreme Committee, applied only to their contracted workers. So at the you know, um, maximum, what they could do is blacklist a company or cancel a contract. But they did not, you know, the laws were not strong enough. So there was no holding companies accountable. And this continues to be a problem where companies and employers are not held accountable for their practices and those who follow ethical practices, be it in employment or recruitment, they do not have an advantage, monetary advantage for doing so, because there's no incentive to be doing the right thing. 
Not that you need an incentive to do the right thing, but when it's such a competitive environment and there are millions and millions of dollars at stake, um, you would want to incentivize those companies that are um, practicing better business, you know, that have better business practices. So what we are seeing in terms of reforms now, um, Qatar did have the ILO technical cooperation a few years ago, and we are seeing good reforms to the labor code. However, the kafala is not the labor code. The kafala system is a very complex network of various codified practices and practices that have been mainstreamed, even if they are not in the law. Uh, these are small communities who hold all the power. And what we're seeing is that the labor reforms are not having the desired impact because the power equation hasn't been questioned and there hasn't been enough of a buy-in locally. Now, when we go to the, um, I think I have about four minutes left, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, now, if you look at where are the workers coming from, uh, they're coming from poorer countries in Asia, increasingly from Africa. Some of these countries have good practices in terms of like, if you see Philippines, yes, there's a commodification of their citizens, but they also have fairly strong practices and bilateral agreements with destination countries. But then you see new emerging source countries from Africa, like from Ghana and from Uganda, they tend to, you know, there's a race to the bottom there. They wanna send as many workers as possible, citizens as possible to work in the Gulf, um, hoping that the remittances will have help local economies. Even countries such as India, which have very strong trade relationships with Gulf, they're not really in a weak negotiating power. They do not uh, push for better rights for their citizens. Again, we need to see that there are uh, you know, pitfalls and shortcomings when you look at bilateral agreements. There has to be a legislative change at destination. But towards that end, we need origin countries to push towards better treatment of their citizens in these countries. We are gonna see an increase of distress migration due to the pandemic, due to the climate change, because there are no job opportunities back home. Uh, climate change is affecting traditional livelihoods. So there's gonna be more of distress um, migration into the Gulf countries, and that is worrisome. In a year and a half, the Football World Cup will be done. And then what? Of course, Qatar has ambitions. They want to bid for the Olympics. That's their next big thing. But for how long do we associate human rights with events and not human rights with the state's reputation, with the state's standing internationally, with their participation in other economic factors? So while I see that, you know, the, the benefits that came from linking Football World Cup to human rights of migrant workers. I also worry that it draws attention to a very small group. For instance, it doesn't draw attention to the entire region. It drew attention only to Qatar, where there are far worse things happening in neighboring states. So how should international engagement then look? What is a better way of carrying this out? Um, I'm gonna stop here because I think I'm coming up to 10 minutes. With just one last point, whatever I said to a large degree, the World Cup projects until now was employing men. We are gonna see an increase in employment of women in hospitality, facilities, management, catering sector. And whatever problems that you may see male migrant workers facing, that is gonna be amplified for women migrant workers and workers who are in the domestic work sector, who are excluded from the um, labor code. I'm going to stop here, Laya, and maybe answer questions later if it comes up. Thank you so much, Fanny. I, yeah. I was so hesitant to like flag you down because I'm enjoying this so much. So thank you very much. I think you've raised some super important questions that I think we'll, we hope to get to in the Q&A period. So thank you. I am going to welcome Fabienne, but I'll just, as Fabienne is setting up his slides, I'll just say I think one of the most important things that, that Vanny, you raised is that you cannot bring about sustainable change unless there's a collective effort to generally mobilize on the ground uh, to stop the to stop the subscribing to exploitative and abusive practices. So I think that's a really good point that I'd love to delve into further, but I won't take up much more space or time. Welcome, Fabienne. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Rani. Thank you, Laya. 
for this great introduction and, and Vanny always uh, is one of the most knowledgeable people I know about labour rights issues in the GCC uh, so it's always a pleasure to, to follow her, um, her points. What I'll try to do with my 10 minutes is expand a bit more about how the workforce um, that is kind of responsible for delivering the Qatar 2022 World Cup um, how it is actually recruited, how, they, how, how workers, as Vanny described, come from the like Arab countries such as Nepal, India, or increasingly East African countries as well, to um, deliver not only stadia, but also additional infrastructure associated or needed uh, for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Uh, and then the majority of my time, I'll try to just do a quick run through, essentially, of, um, of the politics, some of the politics surrounding in particular FIFA from, I'd say, the era of 2010, when um, essentially that was when the bidding was, process was complete and Qatar and also Russia were awarded the World Cup. And as Vanny said, uh, that's when you saw a big increase in discussions around uh, human rights and labour rights issues connected uh, with uh, mega sporting events. Um, I, I'd say some of the, the narrative and dialogue did ex already exist, but I think there's, there's validity to what Vanny was saying. It seemed to be a slight watershed moment. People maybe started to wonder whether we can just improve practices. And I'd actually say that the 2010 World Cup in South Africa um, uh, was also a, a factor in, in kind of increasing awareness and kind of frustration with some of the abuses which were being perpetrated um, in the name of sport, essentially. Um, so, in terms of the Qatar 2022 World Cup, the scale of construction associated not just with building stadiums, but also just wider infrastructure was quite unprecedented. If you look at the bidding documents that uh, the Qatari authorities submitted for the 2010 bidding process, um, it included uh, a plan or plans to build from scratch a number of stadiums and refurbish a few as well. So I think it was a range between eight to 12, which has since been, I think, sized down to about 10 stadia, um, as well as a huge infrastructure program. Uh, in 2017, the Minister of Finance said that Qatar was spending 500 million US dollars per week um, in order to deliver the infrastructure for the World Cup. So, and crucially, he specified he wasn't just talking about stadiums, he said he talked about highways, railways, ports, new airports as well. So just to give you a kind of picture of the scale of construction associated with this huge um, landmark event uh, due to take place in 2022. So obviously what we're talking about is a huge workforce which is being needed. As Vanny said, um, more than 90% of the private sector workforce in Qatar are migrant workers, and therefore that means um, a huge recruitment drive as well. So I'll just refer to this image that you can see on your screens, hopefully at the moment. This image was taken by Dr. Angela Sherwood, who's done a, a significant amount of research around a recruitment of migrant workers to the GCC. And I just wanted to point out a few things uh, to help illustrate essentially the, the process and the pathway. So if you see, one of the first things that I'll point out is as Vanu was saying, at this stage, when this photo was taken, um, the majority of migration connected to the World Cup um, and obviously construction was male uh, focused, predominantly men being recruited. So in this line of workers, this is in Kathmandu uh, airport, um, you see only men waiting to uh, board a plane. You'll see that they're wearing, seem to be wearing red and blue caps. Most likely that is essentially meant to be an indicator for um, they're the person meeting them at the other end uh, so that they can uh, essentially meet the the their new employer um, or know which van to go into or who, who to connect with on the other side you also see that a number of them are looking down at pieces of paper they may well be their contracts and they may well have just received them in that line because uh, that is a quite a common practice that we see uh, that despite kind of uh, paying fees, as I'll discuss in a bit further detail um, going forward, but uh, quite commonly workers may actually only receive their final contract or a contract as they're about to board the plane, and they may actually be seeing terms and conditions which aren't what they agreed with the recruitment agent uh, prior to, to, uh, to handing over money or to signing um, an initial uh, contract. Um, 
I mentioned fees. This is quite, uh, this is an endemic uh, issue in terms of migra recruitment of migrant workers, uh, predominantly, especially to the GCC, but not unique to that region. It's not unusual to see workers paying exorbitant, often illegal fees as well, uh, sometimes ranging, so which can often account for about three months worth of a salary in advance, sometimes can even range up to about 4,000 uh, US dollars, especially when we're talking about Bangladeshi workers, where the rates of fees being paid are particularly high. Um, as I said, workers may be deceived about the nature and the terms of their work. They may be pro promised a certain salary by a recruitment agent when they arrive in the destination country, um, the actual salary is far less, or they may have been told they were going to work as a plumber and end up working as an electrician or vice versa. Um, I think a crucial factor of the kafala system, which, but which I think also kind of drives the nature of recruitment as well, is workers, migrants, have no control over their legal status in the destination country. It's entirely kind of tied to their employer there, and that puts them at significant risk of becoming undocumented if there is um, if their employer does not process the necessary paperwork or if there's a dispute or a conflict um, that kind of level of control over their legal status can easily be used against them in a retaliatory way um, and that's unfortunately a dynamic we see very often. Uh, contract substitution is again sadly very common whereby workers may sign a contract with specific terms and then on arrival uh, be handed a new contract and told these are your actual terms. Often, more often than not, they are worse than the original terms they'd agree with, agreed to. And I would just uh, flag that also, we're talking about a number of uh, abusive, um, abusive practices and access to remedy is incre incredibly limited, both at home and also overseas. Um, I meant, I've mentioned agents quite frequently and this is because they are kind of key factors essentially whether they be licensed or unlicensed brokers who essentially um, facilitate the program process for migrant workers uh, say they're from a rural part of Nepal for example these are the people who kind of make uh, the paperwork happen make connections happen have access to the visas and often there are a number of payments along the way or at least cut um, essentially kickbacks which contribute to the excessive fees that um, I described. I'm hoping that you can see the next stage of uh, the slides, do shout if you can't. So I'm going to move slightly to the politics uh, of, of this situation in the sense that just by from what you heard from Vanny and also when I um, what I was trying to illustrate was the scale of some of the kind of endemic risk to labour rights and traf even trafficking as well, which is already um, embedded and very high risk uh, for migrant workers migrating to work in the Gulf in Qatar as well, and especially uh, and therefore in connection to the World Cup as well. In 2010 was when uh, FIFA awarded the 2018 World Cup to Russia and the 2022 World Cup uh, to uh, Qatar. Um, the man you see in that picture is Seth Blatter. And his uh, kind of right hand man at the time was Jérôme uh, Valka. And Valka was uh, amid some of the kind of uh, concern about, in particular, migrant workers' rights in, in Qatar, but also some of the human rights, you know, a severe human rights crackdown which was happening in Russia. Valka uh, said in an interview FIFA is not the United Nations, FIFA is about sport, it's all about football. We're not there to discuss with political authorities uh, what they should and should not do. He was in particular making the case at that point and in correspondence with human rights groups, FIFA was stressing that it's not a company. They were saying that we're a sports organisation. Uh, so in order to make the case that they were not subject to uh, the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, which actually came into force uh, in 2010 as well. So there was a convergence of all of these kind of dy dynamics around that time. So I think it's fair to say that humans, uh, FIFA's attitude to human rights was quite well, dismissive. They were keen to stress that they had no responsibility. I would also say that it was kind of disingenuous as well, in the sense that where uh, Jérôme Valk was talking about um, not getting involved in uh, issues in, in host countries, uh, if we talk about the 2010 World Cup, which took place in South Africa, there are a range of abuses which happened largely connected to the existence of what are often called kind of FIFA laws, essentially when uh, a country agrees to be the um, host or gets 
is awarded uh, the honor of being the host country for the World Cup, there are a big set of kind of contractual rules and regulations which are which they agree to. Uh, so in the context of the South Africa World Cup in 2010, these include kind of controlled access sites or exclusion zones where there was a kind of significant ramp up of harassment uh, and prosecution, uh, resulting in fines of more than 1000 US dollars for inform informal traders and also evictions of homeless people who may have been traders as well in those areas, essentially just a kind of like I said, a firewall around the World Cup that was actually kind of uh, perpetrating abuses. And like I said, there were tribunals being set up, these kind of FIFA courts. So uh, I do not accept uh, Blatter's point at that, um, that he was making, of, uh, not uh, sorry, Jerome Volk's uh, point of not being involved in um, anything related to politics, essentially. Um, it, around 2015, 15 after uh, the FBI raided uh, FIFA in connection with corruption allegations, uh, rampant corruption allegations. FIFA elected a new uh, president, Gianni Infantino, the man that you see there, who also um, appointed uh, Fatma Samora as the new vice president. There was very much a kind of messaging of cleaning out FIFA, um, of there being a kind of a new era. The man that you see standing with uh, Gianni Infantino at the bottom left of the screen is um, Mr. Ruggie, who is a, a business and human rights expert. He was commissioned or he, he conducted a review of FIFA's uh, kind of processes in particular in relating to human rights. And so I guess I just wanted to flag that there was a kind of narrative around human rights was being engaged with at FIFA and they started kind of publishing regular human rights updates they actually also um, uh, appointed a human rights manager and uh, who was responsible for develop, embedding human rights within um, FIFA's operations. And there was a, definitely a change of narrative, I would say. Um, I'll just flag some of the other things which FIFA uh, took action on in relation to human rights. Um, FIFA statutes were amended. An article was made committing to respect and promote human rights in Infantino's uh, Vision 2.0, which was his kind of new manifesto after he was elected. He committed to um, address human rights issues with the same vigor as FIFA pursues its commercial interests. I always stress that uh, point because we've never seen that written anywhere else again. And I think it was uh, that was much more the kind of language that human rights advocates expect to see acted on. There was an OECD, comp OECD complaint against FIFA as well, where FIFA accepted that it had human rights responsibility, so essentially reversing its, uh, its position from before. FIFA appointed an advisory board with credible human rights experts as well, and adopted a human rights policy, which was, again, credible, largely consistent with the UN guiding principles. So FIFA's position completely changed. Um, the image that you should be seeing now is the opening game of the 2018 World Cup. You see Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and Vladimir Putin having a great time with um, Gianni Infantino. The reason I want to finish my section just kind of looking at this um, with this image, because I think we do need to interrogate further how much uh, these commitments had delivered actual change in terms of human, uh, FIFA's response to human rights risks and I'll try to bring it back as well specifically to Qatar. Um, the 2018 World Cup as I said took place amidst a quite concerted human rights crackdown on human rights defenders in Russia. Again uh, kind of laws were passed and regulations uh, kind of in, in the name of national security connected to the, the running of the tournament which restricted freedom of assembly and freedom of expression and as far as I'm aware, many of them were not repealed from the, the law book as, as promised. And there were also significant labor issues as well. Uh, Human Rights Watch documented labor, like unpaid wages of workers building up to six World Cup stadiums in Russia, um, media reports of North Korean uh, slaves working on World Cup stadiums. Uh, a World Cup stadium in St. Petersburg were, were reporting quite credible as well. And also the um, BWI, the Builders and Woodworkers International Union, um, documented or claimed that at least 17 workers had died. So now we're approaching the 2022 World Cup. I'll return to the issue of recruitment, just to flag that in the local organizers have taken a 
uh, quite innovative approach to the issue of recruitment that we mentioned uh, at the beginning of my section, whereby um, they have put in place a program where they reimburse workers for fees that they've paid without requiring receipts, which is important because workers don't ever get receipts for the fees that they're charged by recruitment agents. I again, would just flag that the key element which Fanny mentioned as well, there's no accountability in this process. Um, this is, as far as I'm aware, uh, this is seems to be something that the local organizers of the World Cup have essentially negotiated with some of their key contractors to essentially um, make payments to workers. I think one thing we need to flag as well is the net, how those payments are processed as well. In the fact that where you have an indebted workforce receiving like um, portions of payments of money that you 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 already indebted for, there is a risk of kind of exacerbating some of the uh, indentured nature of the of working in the GCC and in Qatar. Abuses do are still being documented uh, in Qatar as well. In June 2020, Amnesty International documented at the Al Bayt Stadium, one of the uh, last stadiums to be finished, that there were workers who hadn't been paid for over a year who were employed by a subcontractor um, involved in design uh, activities for that stadium. So I think I would just conclude by saying I think that what we can see is that FIFA now has an infrastructure around human rights. I don't, I'm not yet convinced that its leadership um, is as dedicated to that as some of the staff who are actually trying to embed that human rights infrastructure. And we see that through the way that Gianni Infantino has that relationship that you see with him and Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has only intensified since 2018. Three months after that image, uh, that photo was taken, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, the journalist and dissident was murdered um, with now the credible claims that he was assassinated at the um, direction of the Crown Prince. But that has not stopped uh, the relationship between um, the Saudi royal family and uh, FIFA going uh, becoming much, much closer. Just last week, there was a proposal to um, introduce a biannual World Cup, uh, which is a proposal coming from uh, the Saudi regime, who is increasingly interested in trying to change its image through football. And so what I would say is that while FIFA has a human rights infrastructure in place and there are dedicated individuals trying to implement that, its leadership is still clearly motivated primarily by seeking new markets to maximize its profits. And that's the tension that uh, I think continues to exist. Um, I will pause there and apologize if I ran out, uh, ran over time. Thank you so much, Fabiana. Uh, you've given us so much to think about. Um, as Jules is setting up and welcome Jules, I'll just comment to say that I think it's interesting um, looking at the response, um, particularly the human rights report, it, it sort of echoes a lot of the corporate social responsibility initiatives that we see in other industries like food and apparel. So alarming and interesting. Thank you so much, Fabienne. With that, welcome, Jules. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let you switch on your camera and join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to our, our previous presenters. Uh, it's given us a lot to think about. So I'm gonna shift the terrain slightly from the World Cup of Soccer to the Olympics, which is in the news quite a bit lately, as you'll probably know, Tokyo was selected back in 2013 to host the 2020 Olympics that were postponed by the pandemic for one year. They're supposed to start on July 23rd, just around the corner. We shall see. At the time that Tokyo was selected by the International Olympic Committee, it was all smiles. It was a big embrace. That is often the case when you're at that stage, bidders are embraced by the International Olympic Committee. That embrace quickly turned into a grip in the sense that this is from a, just a, about a week ago when the gentleman at the top, John Coates, who's overseeing the Tokyo 2020 Commission, which is coordinating the games there, he stated that even if there was a state of emergency in place in Tokyo and Japan more generally, the games would and must go on. This was met by workers pushing back across the country. This is just one image from a hospital where workers put outside of on the facade of the building posters, which as you can see, say stop the Olympics and so on. It was approved by the head of the hospital, that kind of pushback. And so I say all that to say, what I'd like to do in my time is lay out what I view 
as some of the less direct ways that the Olympics affect working people's lives and livelihoods and even rights, and then focus a little bit more on some of the direct ways regarding athletes. Let's start indirect. First of all, when your city hosts the Olympic Games, your elites that have made that deal with the International Olympic Committee have made an agreement that it's okay to militarize the public sphere. And so basically all Olympic hosts use the Olympic Games as a way to get all the special weapons and laws they'd never be able to get during normal political times. And those of you who are joining us from unceded Coast Salish territory, also known as Vancouver, you may remember if you were there in 2010, the ubiquitous teal banners that sort of carved off the city from the Olympic zone, as well as the 17,000 or so security officials that fanned out across the area, thousand security cameras that were never put back in the box and returned to center that just stayed and became part of everyday normal policing in Vancouver. It's not just Vancouver. This is from uh, Tokyo where they are instituting facial recognition systems at all Olympic venues that despite the fact that as many will know, there are serious racial bias issues around facial recognition, sort of a soft introduction. It's kind of fun to go to the game and get your face checked, uh, but they can be used later in obviously much more nefarious ways. Also, each host city is required to pass a law to harmonize the local rules and laws with the dictates of the contract that the city signs with the International Olympic Committee. Often that really puts clamps down on the possibilities of engaging in um, political activity and dissent. This is a photograph that I took when I was in uh, Rio de Janeiro, when I was living there as a Fulbright research scholar in the lead up to the Olympic games in 2016, lots of security, eight, 85,000 members of the security team. I'm flagging this from the Rio bid book because it conflates pretty obviously and egregiously conflates terrorism with activism in the very bid book that was proposing hosting the Olympics. Again, that's problematic in so many ways, but when the terrorists don't show up and God willing, they won't show up to any Olympic games or any mega event for that matter, the police are well armed and staffed. And if any activists do show up, they can get, bear the brunt. An example of this could well be Pussy Riot, the art and activist group in Russia. This guy in the front here is not part of the act. He actually is a Cossack who pulled out a whip. So a very low tech kind of a way of suppressing political dissent, but was effective in breaking up the episode. As we'll see, uh, usually it's much higher tech kind of equipment that uh, is, is secured for the Olympic games. It wasn't just Rio that conflated terrorism and activism. Chris Allison, who was coordinating security for the London Olympics, listed what he thought were the four key risks to the games. And you can see protests sort of sandwiched there between terrorism and organized crime. I was also living in London in the lead up to and during those Olympic games. And I interviewed numerous activists that were none too thrilled to be listed in that little order there. The officials in London used the Olympics to put surface to air missiles across the city, including on the top of a residential apartment complex. And people I interviewed from that apartment complex found out about this because they had a little piece of paper slid under their door to inform them, not ask them to inform them that there was missiles ratcheted to their roof. There was a real military sheen because G4S, the private security firm, flopped on its back and was unable to provide the proper a number of uh, bag checking officials for the Olympics. And so they literally called in the troops, many of whom came directly from Afghanistan with no break and got to police the London Olympics. So that was that. Even you might say the mascots of the London Olympics look a little bit like two-legged surveillance cameras. There's also gentrification and displacement. So when I'm talking about all that militarization, that stays in place for the most part, not all of it, but quite a bit of it, and becomes used on normal policing of predominantly ra racialized communities, it must be said, in the host city. Same goes for gentrification and displacement in terms of who it tends to affect. This comes part and parcel with the Olympics as well. In fact, a lot of Olympic bids are pitched to quote unquote, revitalize the area that is being projected to host the games. And that revitalization often means ramping up prices, bringing in 17 new Starbucks and getting everybody who lived there previously to move. I was in Tokyo in July, 2019, and I had the fortune of interviewing two women who not only 
were booted out of their homes to make way for the new national stadium that's being built for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. But as you can see, they were also kicked out around the 1964 Olympics from their housing. This is a photo I took in Rio de Janeiro when I was living there. It's a community called Vila Autodromo, and many people got displaced from there. Rio de Janeiro in general had 77,000 people who were booted from their homes to make way for Olympic venues. One of those people was Eloisa Elena Costa Berto. You can see her over here on the left in her beautiful white dress walking forth out of her home. She invited me and my family to her place as she said goodbye to it. She's a practitioner of candomblé religion. And I wanna just talk about her for a second because behind those numbers, 77,000 people displaced in Rio for the Olympics are actual human beings who are, are affected deeply in, in so many ways. She, as a practitioner of candomblé, had an orisha or a, or a goddess that was located right there along the lagoon. And so her getting removed from her place of living uh, actually held a great deal more spiritual value than, than most people. So we walked down to the water and she let it all go. And uh, she and I did numerous events together around the Olympics. This was one that we did during the Olympic Games um, in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. We actually went to where her her beautiful home once stood and we looked through a chain link fence at what had then become a parking lot outside of the media center for the Olympic Games. That's what her home was sacrificed for. Now I said numbers aren't necessarily the whole story, but they are a lot of the story. This is from Beijing where 1.5 million people were displaced to make way for the Olympic Games back in 2008. And lest you think the International Olympic Committee, the group that oversees the Olympics, found that to be so problematic as to white ball or black ball China from the Olympics forever, no such thing. They actually have signed them on to host the 2022 Winter Games, which are starting in around eight months. What I'd like to do now is shift to some of the actors that are affected very directly. And I wanna kind of talk about people who have been working on the stadiums a little bit less. We have Tokyo, uh, about three people have died from overwork from Olympic stadium building and, and venue construction. In Pyeongchang, the previous host of the Olympics, it was two. Prior to that, Rio, around a dozen people died. Again, the numbers aren't, aren't as high as what we're seeing in Qatar, but that doesn't mean there's not a human cost there. I actually wanna focus though on athletes. Athlete workers is actually, I think the term that's perhaps more correct. As people will know who have looked at the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, there's a term that is used, student athlete, quote unquote. Well, that term student athlete was deliberately designed to not have athletes, college athletes be considered workers because they were asking for worker compensation. They were asking for sometimes death compensation when an, an NCAA athlete had died. And so the NCAA came up with this handy dandy term to call them student athletes instead thereby keeping themselves closed off from those kind of lawsuits and litigation. Well, I'm not suggesting that the term Olympian is quite the same and it's sort of nefarious practicality, but if we use the term Olympian only, I think we miss a lot of the fact that we're talking about worker athletes. There was a study done by Ryerson University in Canada, along with the athlete group called Global Athlete, that as you can see, compared the athlete earnings from the International Olympic Committee with other prominent athletic leagues around the world. And they looked at the revenues from these leagues and the Olympics, and then they calculated how much was being given directly to athletes' pockets. And you can see the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and the National Olympic Committees handed over about 4.1% of the earnings to Olympic athletes, where these other leagues, it was more like 45 to 60%, obviously due to the fact that we have unions in those other leagues, but there's other factors in play as well. In fact, I'm coming to you from the United States where we actually have Olympic athletes and aspiring Olympic athletes who have to start GoFundMe pages to realize their Olympic dreams. When it comes to human rights, there is a rule in the Olympic Charter, which you can see here, that outlaws demonstrations, political or religious or otherwise, at Olympic sites, venues, or other areas. Pretty capacious definition there. That emerged because of this famous moment from 1968 when Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists for human rights, along with Peter Norman for Australia, who wore an Olympic Project for Human Rights button on his jacket there. 
The reason why this rule is problematic is multifold, but I will focus on one, which is to say there's this universal declaration of human rights, Article 19, which states very clearly that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. The Rule 50 in the Olympic Charter obviously cuts into the rights of those athletes should they wish to speak out. We're in an incredible moment right now where you have this zeitgeist of athlete activism around the world taking off from the extended Black Lives Matter moment. And it'll be interesting to see if the Tokyo Games do happen, what what occurs with athletes who are dedicated to speaking out on these issues. There are human rights provisions in the Olympic Charter here, as you can see. There's also the fact that the International Olympic Committee has long worked with the United Nations side by side. The United Nations has promoted human rights through sports and the Olympic ideal. There's been movement from the International Olympic Committee, not unlike what Fabian described with the FIFA group he was discussing. They have set things up, but just like Fabian said, there's a narrative around human rights, but the follow through is often lacking. They set this up, I put this here because it's 2018. There was a paper put forth by human rights workers in 2020, December, that made a whole bunch of recommendations, and then still really no action from the International Olympic Committee on these issues. We used to talk about this as sports washing in the sense that you have these leaders that are pretty keen to use these sports mega events as a way of washing away human rights concerns that are in their country and allows these leaders to stand up, whether it's Vladimir Putin here, whether it's China at the 2022 Olympics, whether it's Alexander Lukashenko, whose uh, capital Minsk in Belarus hosted the 2019 European Games. But I'm sort of wondering maybe if it's actually what we're looking at is is a different version, hearing our previous two speakers, that maybe we're we're into a new territory called maybe rights washing, where you use the narrative around rights to actually erase your record about rights. But I'll leave that for the discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jules. Uh, Again, so much for us to think about and talk about. So... um... I realize we have about 15 or so minutes, Um, although I think our discussions could go on for hours. I think each of you have shared so much for us to think about. So thank you to each of you. Um, I'll share some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A. So we have a question that says, before games, English soccer football players take a knee to confront racism. Uh, In contrast, Spanish teams such as Vila Real in yesterday's uh, Europa League uh, final do not. I think it is quite shameful that they declined this initiative. What could be done to link this progressive initiative among English players regarding racism to the issue of the exploitation of workers who are building these sports uh, mega stadiums, acknowledging some soccer football stars have already spoken out regarding the exploitation of workers for the World Cup in Qatar. Um, I'm suspecting maybe Fabienne, if you wanted to take a first go at that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting question. It's something that I think about a lot. Um, I'll say thank you to that to, to the person who asked the question for reminding me of my team losing in the final yesterday to Villarreal. But um, I like the question because that's how I engage with football. Like I'm a huge football fan. Um, I like to believe in the narrative that you know sport can be for for social change, but I hate to see that taken cynically, as I think a lot of kind of sports um, organizing groups do practice that. I think on the issue of um, players taking the knee in the UK, and it's not just in the UK, that that has been happening in in other um, countries as well. And there has been anti-racist action in Spanish football as well. Um, While I recognize that there has also been like kind of horrific experiences of um, or moments of racism in, in stadiums in in Spanish football as well. I would like to think there is potential um, to link anti-racist struggle. I think that, um, you know, at the heart of human rights and at the heart of anti-racism is solidarity. And the way that I, you know, could imagine that happening or envision that potentially working is that there are activists in the GCC and in the, um, countries of origin who you know if, if, who are at the forefront of mobilizing for their rights their human rights their labor rights um, and I do think that racism as in all societies is a factor in the kind of exploitation and abuse that we do see just last year um, the UN special rapporteur on contemporary forms of racism did uh, highlight the fact that 
in her opinion, having uh, conducted an initial kind of body of research, that the, strat the kind of social stratification that exists in the GCC and the kind of very rigid, um, as she was speaking specifically about cattle, but it definitely exists in all the other GCC countries as well. She was stressing that the the rigid, uh, well, the kafala system and the way that that kind of uh, has this kind of constant army of low paid workers who are predominantly South Asian and East African, but as Vanny said, have no pathway, for example, to belonging or, or to citizenship, are often kind of stuck in uh, low paid work uh, in most cases and are absolutely the most um, marginalized in societies that they often actually live in for a really long time. So racism is a, a factor in um, exacerbating and um, kind of intersecting with the, the labor management system. And so what I would like to see personally as someone who is a football fan, who is involved in anti-racist struggle in football in the UK is to see just solidarity. I, I definitely don't want to see some of the narratives that as Vanny mentioned have sometimes come out where you see like very right-wing newspapers, for example, um reducing the suffering or the uh the situation in, in that workers experienced in the gcc to essentially um promote islamophobic narratives i think that we need to really call that out when it happens because that does happen in a lot of the right-wing media in in the global north and um, they essentially see this topic as something to uh to to just target um groups that they that they like to other and marginalize and they but workers are absolutely just in the background essentially but i think that we can build sort of anti-racist solidarity um by focusing on the struggles by amplifying struggles that um human rights defenders and activists and workers are fighting in, in different societies can i add a quick point to that yeah please please go ahead. Uh, yeah I think it's really important to look at this as a human rights issue and not just a labor rights or a migrant rights issue. We need to look at this as a human rights of the majority in the Gulf and also see how the rights that are denied to the migrant population is often denied to the citizens as well. We need to draw those links. Um, in terms of the protests, uh, we did see, I'm not a football fan, but I do know that I saw these pictures. It was protests against uh, Qatar and human rights. And what stood out for me was some of them are wearing jerseys that had, had Etihad or Emirates on it. So we need to question who's funding these football clubs. You, ha you can't have take money from Emirates or Etihad, UAE, you know, uh, flag bearers of exploitation and human rights abuse, and then criticize another country. We need to start questioning where the money is coming from. And similarly, of course, call out Qatar, but uh, this, this kind of, you know, a thing is what, is why you're not getting local support for the issue because they see it as an attack against Qatar. They don't see it as a defense of human rights. We need to shift to that. You've both raised some excellent points and, and I have my own thoughts on it, but I want to save some space for Jules and, and our participants. So uh, Jules, did you have a comment on that as well? Oh, wow. I'd like to hear your thoughts, but uh, <laughs> but I'll say something real quick and maybe we can, can get you to add your thoughts. I'm, I'm intrigued. So I think this is a place where building from what's already been said, we can differentiate between FIFA and the IOC and the Olympics in a certain respect in terms of if we're trying to get athletes to come along here and link up arms, stand shoulder to shoulder with workers around human rights issues, I think we're going to maybe have a little bit more success in general with the professional football players, soccer players, in the sense that so many more of them, not all of them, but so many more of them who participate in the World Cup are financially insulated, where with the Olympics, uh, what makes it more difficult to organize athletes is that they're amateur, they're not making very much money, they're highly reliant on corporate sponsorship and thus have an inclination not to necessarily speak out on big time social issues that might be controversial. So I think that working with some of these athletes to uh, link arm in arm would be great. In terms of the question around um, taking a knee, and what's intriguing to me is like, and kind of baffling in a way, uh, is the International Olympic Committee's intransigence to allowing athletes to make political stands 
um, it seems really retrograde and it also creates a situation where when athletes do, and if there's the Olympics this summer, athletes are going to do a political stand when they get to the medal stand. It's almost for, for sure thing, given the fact that these movements have created so much space for these moments of athlete activism right now. When that happens, if that happens, then these acts will have so much more power because you're pushing get a back against the International Olympic Committee. What we've seen in the English Premier League where everybody takes a knee before the game, it's powerful. And I'm not saying they shouldn't do it, but you've seen some people like Wilfried Zaha of Crystal Palace, who at a certain point just said, you know what, this is more performative than anything. So when do you cross that line? I'm willing to go there and like try to get to the point where you cross the line, then we think of something new. But I do think it's kind of interesting to think about that as well. Um, but I'll turn it over to you because I'm interested in what you're going to say. Um, and I and I'm uh, trying to make time for the participants, so maybe I will save my remarks for the end okay. if we have time. Right. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Ben Scholl, who's asking how many how how many issues discussed differ, or what new issues do you see on the horizon with the popularization of virtual mega events, uh, i.e., socially distanced live stream playoffs, esports, music festivals, and so on. Any thoughts around, around sort of virtual mega events? And we can we can spend some time to think about that, maybe move on to another question as you're thinking about that. Um, there's a question around uh, from Ken asking, there appear to be a number of reference points and forums that discuss labor abuse. And as an example, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the ILO forum committees, uh, would it be possible to bypass the formal structured entities and move uh, to social media and shine a light on the abuses in the countries at the time of the events? I know that all three of you are quite active on social media, so I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this. I'll open it up to whoever would like to take the question. I can. Thanks, Danny. Yeah. Um, I think social media campaigns are fantastic. It just draws, it definitely draws attention, but when it comes to Gulf states, they can be quite immune to it. They have bot armies that can take on any social media campaign. Um, they can troll an activist out. And then there are cyber crime laws in all of the Gulf countries, which are highly problematic. We have an ongoing case of a worker in Qatar who was blogging, who's been detained in solitary confinement for 23 nights, 24th night. Uh, he's a migrant worker from Kenya, and he's been locked up for blogging and sharing posts about his personal experiences. And we still don't know what he's being charged for. We know locals, women who've spoken up, who've been called up. So I think the cybercrime laws in the Gulf states can be problematic. So if the social media campaign is going to happen from the outside, what impact does it have on the local population? I would still like to believe that using UN instruments to a large degree, putting pressure on the countries, you know, through the treaty bodies, through the special mandates would be effective. At the same time, have a social media campaign um, that will work on this. You raise a really good point, Danny. I, growing up in Dubai, like I remember these topics were not being talked about at, at that time. And I remember just a couple of years ago, I landed in the Dubai airport and there was a huge sort of uh, poster uh, with a hotline for human trafficking to be reported. So I think there are shifts, but you're certainly right. I think I would love to see some of the initiatives that you're mentioning. I think it, it would go a long way. Um, Fabian, I see that your mic is opened. Yeah, I just wanted to, to expand, um, well, agree with and expand on what Bani was saying. I think that as I can't think of any change process that has uh, had impact, which, ha which hasn't used more than one kind of channel or leverage uh, point. So I think, you know, engaging with those structures and forums that uh, the, the question mentioned, I think that that has to, to continue in terms of the reforms that Bani mentioned have come about in Qatar, one of the key Kind of pieces, uh, kind of pieces of pressure or pressure points uh, that contributed to that was the fact that the ILO was threatening a commission of inquiry. Um, that that threat was kind of hanging over Qatar, uh, pushing for labour reforms for a number of years before the technical um, cooperation agreement was signed. So I think we can use these different kind of leverage points to to, dr to drive labour rights and human rights change, and. You know, as as Vanu was saying, that that doesn't prevent us from mobilising in in other forums as well, whether that be online or, or otherwise. I'll actually refer back to a point Vanu was making earlier as well, which, which is the legacy issue, because 
so I can speak with from experience of like working um, when I was at Amnesty in the, the World Cup in 2018 in Russia and there was a especially social media focused campaign trying to disrupt the narrative uh, because I think that's a key element of what a lot of these dynamics are. Jules mentioned are we talk are we looking at rights washing? Um, Vanny was talking about um, the, the scale of kind of social media activity the states kind of uh, put into place. So I think that disrupting narratives and some of the kind of glamour and prestige that um, states want to project by hosting these these kind of events can be valuable. Um, I would just say why limit it to the actual event time as well. Um, I think that you know we, we should be having these discussions in, in, in advance of the events and also after because generally when the whistle blows and whether it's a football match or something kicks off that's where the majority of people's attention does go so what i think is important is to try to puncture kind of um narratives which give a distorted image of what's actually happening on the ground um i think it's important to continue that discussion after the event happens both before and after because i think again if you think of the 2018 world cup most people will remember I don't know, the final um, and Pogba scoring in the last in the final minutes or Mbappe scoring um, and a lot of the attempts to kind of disrupt that narrative are often forgotten but that's why I think that um, and I think that states um, bank on that you know that that's kind of the calculated decision that they make when engaging with 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 sports um, or increasing their engagement with sports issues is that that fans kind of dedication to the, the sport they love or a specific player or something like that or a specific athlete will ultimately override once, as I said, once that, that whistle goes. So I think continuing kind of disrupting those narratives before, during and after um, is something we should always try to, to aim for. I think you make a great point, like sustained efforts, whatever they may be, sustained efforts throughout time before, during and after is, is absolutely key because you're right, that, that sort of hype tends to take over, right? And that's something that, I wanted to ask Jules about, about the Olympics. I know there, there are some questions that I wanted to get to about the Olympics and um, specifically around, uh, there's a question by Janet asking, given that the games have drifted far from the Olympic ideal, the slowness to take up human rights and increase policing, are the, are the Olympics an idea whose time has passed? What factors might be the final straw? Wow, that's a good question and a big one. Um, I don't know, sometimes I kind of think that maybe the Olympics haven't strayed that far from their original ideals. I mean, after all, the Olympics were founded by an aristocratic French baron, along with a bunch of other counts and dukes and princes to create the International Olympic Committee. It was made for elites, run by elites. And in fact, working people couldn't even participate in the early Olympic Games because they were considered workers. Uh, even if you were a grape picker or a bricklayer or what have you, you were considered a worker. Well, that obviously opened up the whole Olympic field to these aristocrats who raked in the medals, including the Baron who started the games, who won an award for poetry at the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm. But, you know, setting aside that history, I do know what you kind of mean in general. Like there are some ideals that are embedded in the Olympic Charter that sound really good. I just think at this point, we have a long ways to go. And I think that actually Tokyo provides a really interesting moment to hit the pause button. I mean, the fact that the International Olympic Committee is ramming ahead during a global pandemic, during a moment when 80 plus percent of the population in Japan do not want the Olympics to happen at a point when less than 3% of the population in Japan is vaccinated um, is just incredible. And it lays bare the sort of uglier dynamics that animate this entire process. And by that, I mean money. It's never been more clear that money rules this process. So I'd say hit the pause button, get some of these human rights ideals in order and in implemented. The reason why they're not probably is because Beijing 2022 is around the corner, like I mentioned before, and the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, is just desperately trying to get past that. And then after that, hey, guess what? In the host city contract with Paris, there's some provisions around human rights, but not Beijing conveniently. So I think it's a great question. It may, keeps me up at night, to be honest. I think about it a lot. I think we have collectively have a long ways to go to address it. Thank you so much, Jules. Again, a, a heartfelt thank you to each of our panelists, Vanny, Fabian, Jules. I follow. I have been following your work for long before this, and I, I'm, I'm sure I will continue to. I've learned so much from your tweets and your publications and 
So again, a big thank you for joining us at all sorts of hours in your time zones. Uh, I'm sure all the panel, all the participants have benefited greatly as well. And I hope that we can continue the conversation hopefully into the future. So thank you so much again. Great, and I just wanted to uh, echo Laya's thanks. Um, and um, I just wanted to very quickly say that I think for those of us who, you know, are labor scholars, labor activists, um, unionists, and I, I see some of those people, you know, questions in the chat, and I apologize that we didn't get to everyone's, um, you know, this is a really important reminder that these are labor and human rights issues, and that those of us who consider ourselves engaged in questions of labor and human rights need to be paying attention to this arena of sports as a really crucial arena where these struggles are playing out. So thank you for all of your comments, you know, reminding us um, and, and impelling us to, to think in those terms. Um, and, you know, with that, I'm going to wrap things up. So, so thank you to, to all of you and thank you to our participants. <laughs>